lead up to this year's World No Tobacco Day 2016, which is just a week away. We will be celebrating the uh, day on next Tuesday, that is 31st of This year's World No Tobacco Day is very special because it is the first World No Tobacco Day after governments of countries of the world adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, one of which commits governments to implement the Global Tobacco Treaty, formerly called the WHO FCTC by 2030. We have a luminary panel of experts today who will share important insights on how to progress towards end game of tobacco. Before we listen to our panelists, let us take a moment to remember and feel inspired by the indomitable spirit and passion of Jules Francisco Dorado who was part of Corporate Accountability International team and a leader with Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals from Colombia. We at CNS, Asha Parivar and NAPM have fortunately worked with him closely as part of NAT in all previous COPs to WHO FCTC. Sadly, you passed away recently but his incredible body of work in challenging Big Tobacco and other development justice initiatives lives on. We humbly dedicate this webinar to celebrate youth's contribution to social justice and CNS will also name one of its annual fellowships to commemorate youth's inspiring legacy. Before we begin, let me make a few quick announcements. Our lead moderator from South African Broadcasting Corporation, Ashok Ramsarup, has recently undergone a major surgery and is recuperating. So we will be missing him on this webinar and do hope and pray he is healthy and back online for the next month's webinar. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait. Just type your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand which you will see on your screen during the question and answer session. I also humbly request all panelists to please present in their allotted time so that we have enough time left for the question and answer session. Thank you for your cooperation. Without any further ado, let us begin the webinar. Our first panelist is Dr. Tara Singh Vam, Regional Advisor for Tobacco Control of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union. He has championed tobacco control in several nations of Asia Pacific, like Nepal, Myanmar, Indonesia, to name a few. Over to you, Dr. Tara Singh Vam. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Hello. Yes, thank you. Thank you very Welcome much. Welcome to the webinar. So the, the CNS team is making a great contribution to uh, improve the global public health program, and that uh, yeah, we would like to pay our sincere thanks and congratulations. Um, thank you for uh, your just, encouragement. Oh, thank just, you. just to highlight this, uh, uh, tobacco is a, as we know, tobacco is a big killer and it kills more than 600 million people every year globally and uh, most of the deaths are in a developing settings especially in Asia and Asia Pacific regions and we also know that uh, the, the passive smoking is also the, the killer uh, the, uh, yeah, we, WHO already presents that uh, more than 600,000 people die due to secondary smoke so the, uh, at the regional and uh, international levels we are making a great efforts on this, and the, the, there are significant uh, the, the efforts uh, are being carried out at the ground level, especially at the country levels, and the, uh, the you can name it the, 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 the WHO, the proven strategy like ban, all types of tobacco advertising, promotion, and sponsorships, uh, the uh, increasing the size of the pictorial health warning, 
uh, and also they ban the indoor smoking and support the, the smoker to quit smoking through the health system and other different ways, as well as the, the one of the most cost most effective strategy is raise tobacco tax. So these all the, the, the five proven strategies we are working at the country levels and supporting the, the governments and the, the civil society to promote these the strategies. And the, another most important part that is, uh, you also highlighted so far, that's the Article 5.3. So in our the, the public health efforts and tobacco control, each and every force tobacco industries are always there and they always try to underestimate and undermine our efforts and block the, our, the, the, the policy, the, the development process. So we, we observe and we are facing those interference from tobacco industry in many countries. Uh, you can name it everywhere at the global level through litigations and also through using the bilateral and multilateral donors and partners. So there are several things going on. So uh, the uh, so then we, as we know that the billion of smokers, they need help, and they are the, the the number of the new smoker, uh, the smokers also coming up every day. So our goal is how to prevent the youth and children smoking initiation and how to help the smoker to quit smoking. So for this, I, I would be uh, more happy to uh, take your few minutes to highlight the, our efforts in, in Asia Pacific on uh, promoting a larger pictorial health warning. Uh, the, as we know, the larger pictorial health warnings uh, are most effective uh, than the text, uh, 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 text warning and uh, they are very uh, effective to promote the quit and build the public awareness uh, among the peoples, especially on the, the vulnerable populations and the illiterate peoples and peoples who do not have access to any health information and the, the, uh, the picture of health warning definitely would, would promote the, uh, and sustain the health information all the time uh, at the household and at the community level. So yeah, in this regard, the, in the, the union uh, and with uh, the many other international partners, we are working uh, very hard at the, at the country level, especially I would like to highlight this, the, the work that we are doing in Nepal, uh, the Myanmar, the Cambodia, Indonesia and so many other countries, and one one of the the uh, the, uh, the big the the win for our public health community, especially in tobacco control, that is the 90% pictorial health warning in Nepal. It was adopted in 2015, so now uh, the implementation is underway. Uh, but uh, we can see the the the, the compliance rate is not fully uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the obtained, but if the uh, because of the tobacco industry, the IT uh, uh, Indian tobacco company, and there are many other uh, the domestic company in Nepal. However, uh, we can see there is some the good progress on implementation in Nepal. Uh, they, uh, in other area like in Myanmar, has just recently uh, adopted a 75% pictorial health warnings, and it will be in force in. Uh, uh, in September 1, and similarly, Cambodia has also adopted a 55% pictorial health warning, uh, 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 and that will be in, uh, that will be entered into force on the 22nd July this year. So uh, this is just beginning in do in these countries, but they they have a clear roadmap to go beyond this that is plain packaging uh, in near future. Uh, so the uh, uh, and we as a partners we are working on this. And we, as we know that these are this effective, uh, this intervention, the, especially the larger picture health one is very effective. You can see one of the slides I have uh, just put there that is comparing the text warning versus pictorial health warning in Myanmar, and they, they are both in the youth population and adult population. The pictorial health warning was found more scary and effective to warn the, the smoker uh, on danger of tobacco use, and we we have. Uh, enough information, uh, the scientific information from different parts of the, 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 the world, the, from Australia, from the, uh, Canada, and from uh, Thailand, and from many parts, and that all the evidence uh, so that larger picture health one is really effective uh, to, uh, to convince the smoker to quit and build the public awareness to, uh, to uh, prevent the new smoking and tobacco use.
uh, one of the slides that you can see the i have just i compared the larger pictorial health warning that is that was the 75% in nepal in the past and the 40% pictorial health warning the effectiveness the of uh, the pictorial health warning to convince the smoker uh, to reduce the smoking uh, 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 number of uh, the cigarette per day if you look at in nepal the, there is significant the very very remarkable reduction of uh, the uh, uh, the number of cigarettes the smoker used to smoke before the pictorial health warning and after the pictorial health warning uh, the, and compared to the indonesia so this the local evidence suggests that yeah, these are the larger pictorial health warnings very effective and they also convince the policy maker to go uh, to increase the size of pictorial health warning and also think beyond the, the pictorial health warning so the uh, uh, i would just uh, would like to jump into like the the efforts that we as a part the international the, the partners and local partners working for the, the graphic health warning larger graphic health warning and also the, the ban all types of tobacco, the advertising, promotion, and sponsorships. So the, the things are being going beyond those, like uh, the, uh, the plan packaging. Australia has started this work and now is spreading uh, in Europe, in the UK, and some other countries. Uh, so in, in Asia Pacific, and in, especially in, uh, in the country like the Nepal, just I had a the, the wonderful meeting with the, the senior official of the government. And now they have started to, to go for plain packaging and they would like to be the number one country again in Asia to introduce their, their new legislation on plain packaging. Hopefully by 6, 2016, the Nepal will uh, they, they, they manage to get the, this plain packaging law. Similarly, the Myanmar, Cambodia, uh, even in, in uh, the Indonesia, they are thinking, they are uh, planning to, to go uh, the beyond uh, the uh, pictorial health warning uh, that's uh, the uh, large uh, the plain packaging. So the my the, the uh, as we all know that uh, this uh, yes, uh, the tobacco packaging is one of the the the, uh, the last uh, the advertisement tools for tobacco industry, and which they, they, are, they are, of course they will fight for this, and they uh, they would like to block this our efforts. But the global the, the, the scenario and global tobacco control community, including the other public health the, the community, now that we are winning the battles. Uh, so I uh, am very much hopeful that if we all work together as a team and will expanding our network to civil society and also other community-based organizations, if we work together as a team, definitely we will have a significant change and improvements. Uh, and tobacco control, especially adopting the, the plain, plain packaging by many countries. Uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't go more details on the benefits of plain packaging, you all know, and uh, we want to make, uh, the, in, uh, in conclusion, we want to make the, the cigarette pack very ugly. So that would really uh, they, they prevent the, the youth uh, and the children's uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, smoking initiation, uh, say, and uh, those they, they are, uh, again the maintaining and sustaining the people health warning is uh, they are uh, another most effective tools uh, to sustain our the public health uh, the, uh, the public education program at the community level all the times uh, uh, all the times so that's the the, the very uh, it's uh, the very significant benefits of it to health warning that we have seen in many other uh, countries. So the, uh, at the, at the, uh, in the other hand, tobacco industry, they are also trying their best to, to block this one. But if you look at the, the recent advances and uh, the win that we have from the from UK, European Union, even from India, and also Nepal, even in the, uh, in the uh, recently in, in Indonesia, we, we have won the, uh, the many tobacco industry litigations. That's really uh, the, the helpful and useful and inspiring the governments to uh, to improve, to advance their tobacco control uh, at the country level. Uh, so the, uh, again, so, uh, we as a, as a the partner of, again, work, let's work together, let's join our hands together to, uh, to build the, the, uh, the political commitments for plain packaging and the uh, and now the, uh, we have to make uh, sure that the gov government are ready to to uh, pick up uh, to adopt this uh, uh, plain packaging 
as early as possible. So they are, uh, we have already started our work in many countries in Asia, uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, so we, uh, I hope that we will have some the tangible outcomes uh, by this year and early next uh, next year in terms of adoption of uh, the clean packaging rules and regulation at the country level. So I would like to stop here. Uh, if any question or comments, uh, I would be happy to take. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tara, and thank you for this. Uh, the salutes to all your efforts for bringing, trying to bring plain packaging in, in South Asia. And we are really happy to know that Nepal is making a lot of progress and other countries will follow. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Dr. Ramakan, who is the Director General of Body for Tobacco Control and has been the President of Association of Surgeons of India in 2012 and the Sark Surgeons Association in the past. He began the first tobacco cessation clinic in King George's Medical University where he superannuated as head of surgery department. He was also its former chief medical superintendent. Over to you, Professor Ramakant. Thank you, Shoma. It's very nice to talk to you. And uh, I will be talking about tobacco and health. There's a very bad relationship between these two and then try to touch the topic of cessation. Uh, dear friends, uh, tobacco kills half of its users, nearly 6 million people each year globally, I'm sure you are aware about that, and over 10 lakhs deaths annually in India. It's a very significant point. More than... Go back. Yes, I'm talking about the tobacco and health relationship, and I'll also touch the point of cessation. Uh, you're all aware that tobacco kills nearly half, half of its users. Uh, one of the only products which used according to the uh, instructions of the manufacturer, even then it kills half of it. And 6 million people each year are dying globally. Over 10 lakhs deaths are occurring annually in India. Now, important point again, more than 5 million deaths due to direct tobacco use, while more than 6 lakh are the result of second-hand smoke. So the passive smoking or second-hand smoking also killing uh, in a very substantial manner. Nearly 80% of the world's 1 billion smokers live in low and middle-income countries, which is a matter of concern because that is where poverty will also even have destroy the treatment uh, schedules and all that. Now coming to leading, this is the leading cause of death, illness and impoverishment and therefore it's getting one of the highest attention at present globally. Tobacco epidemic is one of the biggest public health threats the world has faced ever. Uh, second hand smoke kills, this is an important mention, information which I'm sure everybody is convinced about that it's improved. And more than 4000 chemicals have been found in tobacco smoke and 250 are known to be harmful and more than 50 are known to cause cancer and their carcinogenic. There is no safe level of exposure to second-hand tobacco smoke, which becomes a matter of great concern. Now, studies show that awareness to hazards of tobacco use is very poor, and tobacco users need help to quit. They can't quit themselves so, you know, very effectively, as so it's a very small percentage. And among the smokers who are aware, most want to quit, and that's a good sign. And comprehensive cessation services with full or partial Cost coverage available in only 15% of the world's population, which is very, very low. And very important thing, which I've already mentioned also, the picture, pictorial warnings and mass media campaigns, they do work and they are very helpful. Now, regarding the hazards, it's a big topic, but I'll try to summarize in a very simple way. The, this tobacco, you know, utilization use can damage the present generation and it can damage the future generation. Regarding the present generation, this can be individual which may, who may become addicted to it, financial, you know, damages will be there that he will be losing a lot of money on that and therefore health and family will suffer. And the respiratory, oral, cardiac, pulmonary, vascular disease and then a very substantial manner cancers. So therefore individual can develop a large number of diseases related to these organs. And then the family or society can also be affected by the same thing by their passive smoking and also peer pressure. Peer pressure I mean for starting and also for when somebody is tolerating, when somebody is not understanding that the skills and somebody is smoking in the family. Now, coming to the future generation, if a pregnant mother is in the home or in the atmosphere, 
where the smoke is there, tobacco smoke is there, then the low birth weight babies, premature births, mental deficiency, birth defects, and sudden death syndrome have been observed. And there is a strong link to major non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and this is very important in tuberculosis and many others. Regarding tuberculosis, it is very important to learn that nearly three to four times more chances of developing tuberculosis are present in a case with smoker. I'm showing some of the slides, we will see this, this is leukoplakia. Oral chewing is very common in our, in our country and also common in many countries. And you can see this white discoloration is a precancerous condition. Here you can see a cancer cheek is developing and you can see the dental destruction, the gingivitis and infections in the tall teeth and not only discoloration but also malfunctioning. And this is a condition called as submucosal fibrosis. Here, because of tobacco, the person cannot move, open his mouth, and therefore you can see this man is trying to open, he cannot, at a young age, he had developed this complication, which in itself is a precancerous condition. Now coming to the tongue, you can see people used to keep the quid under the tongue, and therefore the, you can see that arrow where the tumor has developed and cancer tongue has occurred. Then this cancer has burst out, it's called a fungation, and this is from oral cancer leading to secondary in the neck, and therefore, this is a very costly situation and a very hopeless situation. Here is a person who is used to keep his spirit into the front of mouth, in between the lips, and you see developed cancer. This is another person who has advanced oral cancer, which has fungated out and also is almost unresectable and difficult to treat. Here you can see the whole of the cheek is damaged. The cancer will advance to that extent. A torch is showing out of the cheek. And this is an advanced over cancer. Dear friends, it is very important to learn not only human being, this is also spoiling the animals. And this is one of the dog of a minister who used to take tobacco and develop cancer. And he showed his dog, and you can see the arrow shows it that the dog also had a blood tongue cancer because he was giving this tobacco to the dog also for chewing, and he used to take it. Coming to the other hazard, which is called a vascular hazard, there's a special disease called a virgin disease can develop. And vascular, you know, anomalies can occur which are, which are going to constrict the vessel, whether cardiac or peripheral. Peripheral vessels, you can see here that both the limbs of this vendor have lost, and this lady also, who was a tobacco chewer, also lost both the limbs because of the disease. Then this is the final situation where you find the cardiac failure occurs, myocardial infarction occurs, and the dreaded complications occur when a person is in such a situation. And coming to the tobacco cessation, Briefly, I will tell that counseling is the most important step, which may be individual, it may be group, it may be family, and then physical evaluation and physical strong grading is done regarding the severity of the, uh, the uh, addiction. And pharmacotherapy in selected cases, and the awareness programs are very important to prevent all this, and raising taxes and law have been proven to also help the, in the control of tobacco. Then the status of tobacco control or in Indian context, I will say that it is very unsatisfactory even today. Lack of drive and interest, more of concern, less of passion, and poor final results with higher rate of restarting tobacco. The results of the best possible methods of management in tobacco cessation are not very high sounding. So therefore, when they see the result or they know the result, then they become frustrated and they start tobacco again. So therefore, this is a very bad you know, problem that something which is preventable, which can easily be you know, controlled by first and avoided right in the beginning. And this is a high time when tobacco has to be banned by all means, manufacturing and those things. And I'm sure we are gradually going to towards that state. And uh, you can see for plain packaging, those things are there. And this is something you can see the heart is saying, not for me tobacco effects are there, and ultimately you will find it's killing me. The heart is saying it is killing me, and the vessels will stop functioning. And within a few seconds, you will see the heart will stop, become slow first, so therefore the medicardia is occurring, and then painfully it will lead to a sudden death, and that is the real picture. So therefore, I'm, this is the uh, situation, and we all wish that we were successful in controlling tobacco and uh, really getting a tobacco free world sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramakan. Thank you for an enlightening presentation. And coming from a doctor's mouth, we have to take it verbatim. Before we go on to our next speaker, I request all the participants 
please keep on sending their questions by the chat function and not wait till the end. Our next panelist is John Stewart, Deputy Campaigns Director of Corporate Accountability International and a leader with Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals or NAT as it is commonly known. We believe if, if it was not for historic contribution of groups like NAT, it would have been difficult to fireball the Global Tobacco Treaty with WHO FCTC Article 5.3. Thank you, Nat, and thanks to leaders like John. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you so much, Shoba. Um, is my um, screen shared? Is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so, as Shoba mentioned, my name is John Stewart. Um, I'm the Deputy Campaigns Director with Corporate Accountability International. Um, if you are not familiar with Corporate Accountability International, we are a membership-based organization. Um, we're based in the United States, but do work internationally to protect human rights, uh, public health, and the environment from dangerous or irresponsible actions by multinational corporations. Um, throughout our almost 40-year history, we've waged and won campaigns that have forced some of the largest corporations in the world to end their life-threatening abuses, um, starting with Nestle um, when it was aggressively marketing infant formula in Global South countries that didn't have access to clean drinking water, um, to securing uh, international code uh, through the WHO regulating uh, baby formula substitute marketing, uh, to being one of the first NGO observers to the FCTC. Um, our role uh, since the beginning of the inception of the FCTC has been to monitor, expose, and challenge the tobacco industry's role in both the development um, but also now the implementation of the life-saving measures of the FCTC. Um, so over the next uh, five or six minutes, I'll be just giving you the basics of um, the tobacco industry's tactics to undermine public health globally. Uh, and then I'll focus in on um, a recent case study, um, British American Tobacco, uh, and some revelations that came to us last year uh, about um, one of the largest uh, conspiracies of bribery that's ever been documented by um, an internal whistleblower. Um, and then I'll talk about how that relates to um, the mechanisms that civil society and governments have within the FCTC to rein in the tobacco industry's abuses. So to begin with, it's important to remember the size of scale and scale of big tobacco. Um, and we say big tobacco because the tobacco industry remains one of the most consolidated industries on the planet. Um, in 2010, uh, the combined revenues of British American Tobacco, Japan Tobacco, and Philip Morris International were $200 billion, which are greater than the combined GDPs of all of these countries combined that you see here on the screen. Um, and that's important to keep in mind because when governments are faced with intimidation by the tobacco industry, um, they are in, t in turn forced to deal and contend with um, the incredible political and economic clout of these corporations. So um, the industry, because it has a financial incentive to uh, continue to uh, profit from the sale of its deadly and addictive products, um, will do everything in its power to undermine the life-saving measures of the FCTC, which are designed to reduce tobacco consumption. Um, the tobacco industry's tactics and strategies are well documented, mostly thanks to the release of millions of internal documents um, through the Master Settlement Agreement, the uh, large-scale uh, lawsuit uh, by attorneys general in the United States in the late 1990s. Um, but since then, many, many of the tobacco industry strategies and tactics to undermine tobacco, tobacco control measures and public health measures at large have been well documented. And this is just a a short list of the primary tactics. Um, one interesting note is that we've started seeing uh, other industries from the junk food industry to the fossil fuel industry uh, take the, the page out of the tobacco industry play 
playbook when it comes to blocking regulations designed to protect public health and the environment. So to give you an, a real life example of uh, what this looks like, late last year the BBC exposed for the first time British American Tobacco's widespread and systemic use of bribery to influence politicians, parliamentarians, public health officials, and even staff of competitor tobacco corporations in five countries in Central and East Africa. Um, though many of British American t Tobacco's intimidation tactics to secure influence and stymie health policy in Africa were already well documented, um, the BBC's revelations exposed the shadowy and illicit strategies that BAT employed behind closed doors to curb the passage and implementation of life-saving tobacco control policies across Africa. And these, um, these bribery tactics were exposed by a whistleblower um, who had worked for British American Tobacco Kenya for 13 years. His name is Paul Hopkins. And um, he was a self-described commercial hitman, um, and he revealed that he had made uh, literally hundreds of legal payments running into thousands of dollars to compromise policymakers, and in one case even demanded a draft copy of Burundi's tobacco control bill from its contact person in that country's government to, quote, accommodate amendments before the president signs. Um, it's also notable that um, uh, this same whistleblower bribed in a representative to the FCTC uh, international treaty meetings um, from Burundi, uh, uh, giving him a payment to basically represent the industry's interests at that meeting. Um, so the the good news is that um, you know following the airing of that documentary, Corporate Accountability International partnered with organizations across the world, but mostly in Africa and the UK. Uh, to call for accountability, and um, we uh, organized uh, public health um, and civil society organizations to call on UK authorities uh, to launch an investigation into British American tobacco's um, bribery scandal. Uh, their activities were illegal under uh, the 2010 Bribery Act in the UK, uh, which could result in civil and criminal uh, liability. Um, we also organized uh, folks in Kenya to call for an investigation in that country, and um, the Kenyan government recently committed to doing so. Um, we also organized members of Congress in the United States, um, because uh, under United States law, any corporation that trades on the U.S. stock exchange must abide by certain uh, provisions, including um, anti-bribery measures. Um, and uh, finally, um, it's notable that the tobacco industry had sued Kenya previously uh, to the revelation of this bribery scandal um, for failing to consult adequately the industry um, during the process of developing its public health regulations. Um, and the good news is that, um, you know, in part due to uh, the discredited image of British American tobacco, um, though, of course, there was a lot of uh, work um, among their legal team behind the scenes. Um, uh, Kenya, the Ministry of Health, just recently won that case. So its public health regulations are being held, upheld, even in the face of industry intimidation. So um, this is emblematic of two control mechanisms that we have for the tobacco industry within the FCTC. Article 5.3, um, which... Um, basically puts a firewall between the tobacco industry and public health officials, um, also includes protections for the actual treaty meetings themselves, and Article 19, um, which uh, is designed to hold the tobacco industry legally liable for its abuses. Um, both of these issues will figure front and center in the agenda for the upcoming Conference of the Parties for the Global Tobacco Treaty, the FCTC, in um, in India in November of this year. Um, so just very quickly, um, Article 5.3, the premise behind it is very simple. Uh, basically, the tobacco industry is legally obliged to increase tobacco consumption and profits for the shareholders, and the goals of the FCTC 
are to reduce tobacco consumption. So therefore, the tobacco industry has a fundamental irreconcilable conflict of interest between the interests of public health and the interests of the tobacco industry itself. So uh, countries under the FCTC are obliged to protect their tobacco control measures from the undue influence of the industry. Um, and countries are implementing uh, Article 5.3 measures around the world, but they're not implementing them quickly enough. Um, and tobacco industry inter interference remains one of the greatest threats to the implementation of all of the FCTC's life-saving measures. So um, at the upcoming COP, um, there are a couple recommendations that will be uh, uh, coming out of a report of experts on Article 5.3 for how to accelerate implementation, and um, here is a list of those recommendations. Um, the other mechanism is liability, uh, basically the idea that the industry should be held legally liable for the high cost of health care associated with its products, as well as illegal activities such as the bribery scandal that I um, talked about before. So. Um, Again, a group of experts from around the world, um, including a, a Corporate Accountability International staff member, got together um, in April and came up with a list of recommendations um, for parties for how to, how to accelerate implementation of liability mechanisms within their countries to hold the industry legally liable for its abuses. Um, and finally, um, uh, the BAT bribery scandal revealed that the industry will stop at nothing to undermine um, the most important venue for all of the tobacco control decisions that are being made globally at the, at the conferences of the parties. Um, so one item on the agenda will be how to protect the cops themselves from the tobacco industry's influence. So I'll just stop here and just say, um, you know, re reiterate my main points, which uh, again, the tobacco industry and its attempts to block, weaken, and delay tobacco control measures still pose the single greatest threat to the implementation of the FCTC. Um, Big Tobacco continues to use really aggressive tactics to block, weaken, and delay tobacco control measures, but the good news is that parties have two uh, very powerful tools at their disposal to push back against the industry's influence, Article 5.3 and Article 19. So. Um, that one of the top priorities for this upcoming COP will be accelerating the implementation of these two measures um, to accelerate uh, the implementation of uh, the FCTC's life saving potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for unmasking the wolf in sheep's clothing. And now we move on to Ivana Taus, the policy advisor of Framework Convention Alliance for Tobacco Control or FCA. Over to you, Ivana. Are you there? We can see your slide. We invite I request the participants to please keep on sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand, which you will see on the screen in the question and answer session. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, um, we can hear you very clearly. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Shoba. And thanks to everyone for joining this webinar. Um, I'll be talking about tobacco and development. And many of us think about smoking and uh, other tobacco use as a health issue. And in many parts of the world, uh, people think about it as a health issue of the past. And what I want to tell you is that it is not just a health issue. And it is um, not an issue of past, certainly uh, not uh, any, any more important than it's been 10 or 20 years ago. 
Um, just some numbers to start with, and this goes back to uh, our first two panelists. There are at least 1.1 billion people who smoke, uh, and obviously more people than use tobacco. And those people mostly live in uh, middle or low-income countries. And most of these people are poor. That's because there is a vicious cycle between tobacco use and poverty. Um, the less uh, opportunities you have, the more prone you are to start smoking or using tobacco. And once you get into this cycle, you're trapped because obviously um, nicotine is addictive. And then you just kind of keep spending more resources on tobacco, the resources that you would otherwise spend on education or your housing or even your daily food. Uh, now, another important number to keep in mind is one trillion, and that's one trillion dollars. Uh, we don't know exactly how much uh, tobacco costs the global economy. Uh, the studies are underway and numbers might be available later this year, but it is uh, definitely more than one trillion dollars a year. And that's because the disease caused by tobacco use, and we've heard about those lung diseases, cancers, heart disease, or even diabetes, impose high productivity costs to the economy. Um, people who get sick, and who die prematurely are simply not able to contribute by working. Um, and we have also lost economic opportunities. Uh, um, and these are particularly uh, really hampering economies of countries um, which are having uh, growing populations and growing tobacco use, and those are mostly countries in, in the region of Southeast Asia. Now, um, now that I've shared with you some of the bad news, I have some good news. And again, um, my, uh, my colleagues already mentioned the fact that we have a package of evidence-based tobacco control measures. It's called WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Yes, it's a booklet, but it's a, not an ordinary booklet. It's a internationally negotiated legally binding convention to which governments uh, of 179 countries plus, plus the European Union agreed. And this, this treaty covers almost 90% of the world's population. Um, we are talking here today because of the World No Tobacco Day and the, and the plain packaging that it's, it's Theme. This goes to um, two articles that are covered by this convention, the Article 11 and Article 13. And so if you get the chance to look at this convention on page uh, 9 and 10, you will see um, the commitments that the governments agreed to. And in fact, the, the commitment to have pictorial health warnings, the topic that Tara talked earlier today, uh, is, is covered there. Now the second good news uh, is about the fact that um, the FCTC, the implementation of the convention, is now among the world's development priorities, the so-called sustainable development goals. And here on the slide you can see uh, how it fits. There are 17 sustainable development goals. One of them is health. Under this goal, there are nine targets, nine commitments. One of them is to reduce um, the premature deaths from non-communicable diseases, so diseases like uh, cancer and heart disease. And uh, there are also four targets which tell governments how to actually meet those sustainable development goals. Those are the means of implementation targets, and one of them is on the FCTC. And there are only two other international conventions which are uh, clearly referenced in SDGs, so this shows the commitment to tobacco control within the global development agenda. 
And uh, finally, the third good news um, is about tobacco taxation. And as Tara and others mentioned, this is one of the most effective tobacco control measures. And not only because it targets the uh, most disadvantaged population and youth, the, the more expensive the tobacco is, the less people will likely buy it. But it's also because it's good for health and good for government revenue. And uh, earlier um, in 2015, even before the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted, the governments did recognize that price and tax measures on tobacco will uh, be very effective in fighting tobacco consumption, but also represent a stream for financing of development in, um, in, in many countries. So uh, by implementing the FCTC, by increasing taxes on tobacco governments can not only prevent death, but they can also help themselves to actually fund other development priorities. Now, the not so good news is that uh, all of these commitments that I've talked about are uh, in place, but the action is lagging behind. And the World No Tobacco Day is one opportunity where we can bring the attention on this topic, and I do encourage everyone on this webinar to do so, and media is extremely important in, in doing this job. And I want to also talk about the opportunity that is coming up later this year, and uh, it's a seventh session of the Conference of the Parties to the FCTC, which will take place in India. Uh, if we want the governments to take action, there is no better place to focus our attention. Um, the COP, the Conference of the Parties, is like a global government for tobacco control, and uh, in less than six months in India, um, over 150 governments will gather to decide on actions that need to take place on global tobacco control in the next two years. That's because the, these meetings, these COPs, take place only every two years. And so it will be very important to see governments actually taking action and making sure that tobacco control becomes part of every development effort uh, and that there are more resources devoted to tobacco control. Uh, because as John talked about, tobacco industry, the vector of this, um, this, this, uh, this disease and, and the tobacco use is a very powerful and wealthy industry. And so we need the resources uh, to fight it. Now, I've included in my slides also some helpful resources uh, for you if you want to, to learn more about some of these topics. And you have the link there to um, the website of the COP7. And that is it for, for me. Thank you very much. And uh, I would be very happy to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you. you, Ivana, and I'm sure there will be questions for you. Uh, and now, last but not the least, we have Rahul Devedi. Director of Vote for Health Campaign and Country Coordinator of APAC Youth Action Network and GYAT Leader. Over to you, Rahul. Yes, Rahul, we cannot hear you. Hello. Yes, yes. Can you hear me, Shobha, now? Uh, yes, greeting yes. everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, the point that I want to raise uh, out of my uh, presentation uh, is youth should uh, should be realized target of uh, tobacco control, not the tobacco industry. As uh, evidence shows uh, that um, uh, over eighty percent of tobacco addiction begins before the age of eighteen. So it is quite clear that uh, youth are targeted by uh, deceptive, misleading, and deceptive ways of tobacco industry to keep their uh, revenues flowing in. The tobacco uh, industry loses uh, over six million of its customers. That is why they want to recruit um, a lot more uh, to be in the business. So children and youth uh, are sadly bec uh, becomes a soft target for tobacco industry, and whereas. We, we uh, believe that children and youth must not be target of tobacco industry. Children and youth can play an important role 
in uh, ending the game of tobacco epidemic. And that is why we have been um, consistently working with uh, children and youth to empower them and help them make an informed choice whether to choose life or to choose death. Now, when our gov when government across the world are <coughs> committing uh, the agenda 2030 uh, for sustainable development board SDGs, and I am very much sure uh, SDGs uh, achieving SDGs would not be possible until and unless we uh, engage young people meaningfully. And uh, that is why uh, I want to raise uh, <coughs> this, uh, that uh, youth are not only the pro part of the problem solutions, and they need to be empowered and <coughs> with tools and, uh, <coughs> and need to be engaged in policies and programs so that um, they can help out uh, to combat the situation and uh, face the problems. And uh, uh, in India, here uh, in India, we have uh, one such tool that ca uh, calls right to information, which empowers every citizen to seek information from public uh, departments. And uh, use of in, uh, RTI uh, in tobacco control has been very effective. And we have uh, experiences uh, uh, to use of RTI by empowering young people, especially. So every year, uh, in leader to um, World No Tobacco Day, uh, <coughs> we uh, organize a week-long rights and responsibility support summer training programs, especially for young children, where we try to build their capacity and give them hands-on training uh, of filing and uh, drafting and filing RTI applications uh, pertaining uh, to seek information why tobacco control policies are not implemented. For example, where why there is a retail outlet shop within the 100 shares of education institution when the law prohibit it, prohibits it. So um, then in fact, yeah, as you can see, the, uh, on many occasions when the RTI applications have been filed in uh, government departments such as police departments, many times police departments and uh, uh, government departments which, which are responsible to implement national tobacco control prog programs has, uh, uh, have taken the cognizance of it and they have to redu uh, uh, remove the tobacco or retail outlets uh, from 100 yards of educational institutions and media has also reported uh, such instance, instances very well in, here in Lucknow. So um, we, we have been working with uh, uh, young, chil uh, young children and youth and uh, in line with this we also organize uh, one such uh, important uh, workshop that is uh, that was on advocacy training uh, workshop on WHO's FCTC article 5.3 and where uh, uh, we uh, uh, collaborate with civil society organizations as well as government representatives to participate in this uh, um, workshop as, and youth who are also part of this uh, training process and pro workshops. And they will uh, continue engaging youth in such way uh, in coming futures to combat the tobacco control um, way to, to come uh, uh, to, to defeat this tobacco epidemic. Um, so with this slide, as uh, time is running by, I, will, I would like to end my presentations. I am very, uh, very happy to take the questions uh, in the question and sessions. Thank you so much. Over to you, Sula. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, we begin our question and answer session. We already have too many questions. And I would request the participants to keep on sending them. Uh, Aarti Dhar, a very senior journalist from India, uh, wanted to ask a question. Aarti, if you are there, would you like to ask the question yourself? Aarti, can you hear me? Shobha? Yes, yes, Aarti. Yes, we can hear Hello. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you very clearly, Aarti. Okay. So, uh, I was just wondering, why is there never a demand for banning tobacco, uh, unlike liquor, though both are very high revenue earning sources? It just leaves me you know, wondering. But would anybody from the panelists like question? to answer that? Yes, please do, Doctor. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. I would like to answer the question. You're asking why tobacco is not banned to compare it so with what, alcohol. Yeah, this this situation yes, is? Yes. Is that so? Yes. Yes, yes. You're asking that. All right. So the, the problem is the tobacco is being banned. It's use of tobacco, especially in, in smoking form. And gradually you're finding that the efforts are being made. The point actually sometimes comes is that uh, the, the industry, they claim that there is a gen role of genetical uh, predisposition also. 
they say if a person has got a, they have to develop a lung cancer, they got a special gene, and that gene is already there. And even if he does not smoke, that's what they claim, he will de develop cancer. So this is how somehow the other they create confusion. And uh, although there are a lot of studies done in uh, twins and other places that con and controlled scientific studies have been done, and uh, there's no doubt about all this that they, they causes cancer, it causes complications like emphysema, bronchitis, heart disease, so many things. So what happens is actually this is what comes in the way gradually. But a day will come, first will continue, and you find people are getting convinced that this has to be. Second point is that sometimes it has been classified as a, as a drug, and, and the tobacco has been used in certain diseases. And that one of the disease was Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this has been used. Therefore, they keep on claiming that if, if drug can be a, you know, harmful to some person, but sometimes it is used, it cannot be you know, removed like that. And therefore, the banning is not possible. So therefore, there are things which are coming now towards the closer that ultimately it will be banned. And regarding alcohol, I can tell you very frankly, it has a lot of you know hazards and problems. But because, uh, for example, uh, one of the states in our own country, more than 60% of the revenue the government earns from alcohol. So therefore, alcohol is being uh, you know taken in a different spirit. And unfortunately, but you are very right, the time is ripe, and it is for the efforts are also in full in vigor that tobacco should be the manufacturing should be banned. I told you the limitations are only two. Thank you. Uh, Arti, I would like to add that, that at least uh, Gutka has been banned in many states of India. Yes. And let us hope yeah. that the next step would be uh, banning cigarettes as well. So okay. I think uh, media can play a big role in that. And then we, we, in fact, we had a question from Roger Paul from Uganda. Uh, who says that as media, how can we reverse this trend of so many million people dying annually from tobacco? And what can be a strong media agenda to ensure government's commitments to take strong action, apart from just commemorating World No Tobacco Day? These are his words. Anybody would like to answer this? Ivana or John, would you like to answer the role of media? Ivana mentioned that in her presentation. Uh, yes, uh, sure, and and thank you for this uh, really excellent question. I think that you know bringing more attention to the topic, um, talking about what is happening in your country and what specifically is your government doing, is very important. So looking into is there a tobacco control law in place and is it in fact enforced, and what are the obstacles? government um, employees face in doing their job on tobacco control? Is there actually someone working on tobacco control in your country? Uh, what is their budget to do the job? What type of revenue the government raises from tobacco taxation and how much it invests in tobacco control are some of the facts that you know, if you expose them, you just show is is the commitment of the government really there, and is there not? And I will let the John speak about bringing the attention to what the tobacco industry is doing because that's that's the other part that is very important. Yeah, thank you, Ivana. Um, it is it is very important, especially um, you know in global north countries, the tobacco industry's reputation has been so tarnished and discredited. Um, that it makes it easier for governments to um, enact regulations on the industries and controls on the industries. But in the Global South, um, the tobacco industry invests a lot of money in corporate responses, responsibility programs to uh, boost its image, position itself as a essential um, actor within the economy um, when we know that um, it is anything but. Um, and is actually um, enacting uh, and is uh, working behind the scenes, as we saw with the British American tobacco bribery scandal, uh, to undermine democracy and promote its deadly products, no matter what. Uh, so the the media has a very important role to um, you know to not take the tobacco industry's public relations materials at face value, to expose the truth behind what the tobacco industry is doing. Um, whether it's in Congress or Parliament, um, and to uh, you know promote uh, 
tobacco control policies when they're um, when they're introduced into Parliament or Congress. Thank you. I just like to add that as both of you have said, we have really need we really need to watch out about the corporate capture of media, which which is happening in a big way. So media needs to be alerted and aware of that as well. It's done in a very subtle way, but the way industry is trying to capture the media. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Actually, one thing I didn't mention was that um, one of the things that the VAT bribery scandal revealed was that the tobacco industry did have journalists on its payroll and was um, paying off journalists to basically quell dissent within the media um, about its activities. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a participant, Dr. Ziauddin Islam, uh, who, uh, from, from the Tobacco Control Department, Pakistan. Dr. Islam, would you like to ask your question if you're there? Dr. Islam. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shobha. Uh, there is always the uh, argument from the tobacco industry. Whenever uh, we, we ask them for raising the taxes, all over, in, all over the world we see the, their response is by raising the taxes, the illicit trade will be increased. So I just need your response. Thank you. Okay. John, would you like to answer that? Um, sure. I'm, I, you know, the... I'm, I'm happy to answer as well. Please, please Bonica, yes. I was coming to Okay. Uh, so, so the so the uh, the first response is uh, one of the highest taxes on tobacco control are levied uh, uh, by the governments, uh, for example, in Europe or or in Canada, and those governments have absolute uh, have very low levels of illicit trade. There is no correlation between tobacco taxes and the level of illicit trade. The correlation or, or the relationship is there uh, between how the government can protect its borders and uh, whether it can enforce uh, the law. Now, these are all very important issues and we know that some governments do indeed fear that the uh, illicit trade will, will grow, but that's why there is a um, protocol in illicit trade that's been adopted by the governments, uh, and it includes two important provisions uh, that even if the governments don't ratify the protocol, sign up to it like they did um, for the treaty, which Pakistan did, um, they can implement these two measures. And the first one is to uh, license all production, all the chain of production of tobacco products and uh, issue stamps and, and codes for all tobacco products so that it is possible to verify where these products come from. So uh, this is a very, very long response, uh, but you know, the, the argument, uh, what I want to say is the argument of illicit trade is just simply a tactic of tobacco industry to scare governments. And I would be more than happy to provide you with more information. Uh, maybe you can email me uh, and we can certainly think about what type of argument is the best one for uh, the government of Pakistan to address this. But I uh, just not be, not, not be intimidated by it because they've used it in many, many countries and, uh, you know, the evidence shows that uh, there is absolutely no relationship between increasing tobacco taxes and the illicit trade. Uh, thank you, Ivana. Uh, we have a question from Angufa from Cameroon and perhaps this is, uh, this would be, could be answered by Professor Ramakan. Uh, Angufa wants to know, yeah. are chewing to are chewing tobacco and snuff safer alternatives to smoking cigarettes? And what are the health risks of smoking pipes and cigars? Are they different from cigarettes or the same? Well, actually, this is a, a very simple question. It's a very important question also. This, uh, there's nothing which can replace poison to poison. The important thing is that whatever, you, whether you use by oral route or you use by nasal stuff, or you use by, by you know smoking or inhalation, the ultimate hazards will be same except the local part. For example, with the chewing tobacco, people will develop more of oral cancer, tongue cancer, they will develop pharyngeal cancer, laryngeal cancer. But 
with smoking they will have more of the you know lung cancers but then other hazards will also occur because it is absorbed by blood and same thing as he was asking about the pipe pipes are still more dangerous because they have a higher concentration that is one and number two is that the, the temperature and the strikes against the more more of the people will develop the oral cavity problems and pharyngeal and laryngeal cancer. So therefore, I will not suggest that anything is a replacement. Nothing, both are uh, harming in the same way, whether it's a cancer of the oral cavity or the cancer of the lung or a heart disease, it, there's no question. I will say finally, in very simple way, that poison is a poison. And therefore, there should be no alternative except this, this, this people have to quit it and get rid of it. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry we are running out of time, but questions are pouring in. So we will take in a few more questions. Is Francis Okoyo there? Francis wanted to ask a question. Would you like to ask Francis? Francis, are you there? He wanted, he wanted to ask why have African countries failed to stop widespread use of tobacco? especially while implementing decisions for tobacco control. Well, He's a journalist from I understand the things are, uh, the, the problem is that uh, in African countries, they are all observing that so many things have failed. The reason is because possibly the proper administrative setup is not there, the awareness is very poor, and then implementation programs are not with passion by and then poverty is the most important factor working there. Therefore, this is something where awareness is important to people, government, administrators, the medical professionals, they all have to be combined together along with the media participation. Then only you can achieve certain things. So therefore, the answer is very simple. The awareness is not there, people are not knowing it. And there's hardly very, very poor communication between the you know the people who matter and uh, those who can control and that may be one of the important reasons why it is happening same thing is happening in villages and many of the rural areas in our country also so the, the effect will only occur when our reach becomes outreach and we reach to them instead that they come to us that's how the things will come I think that's the answer okay. Okay. Uh, we have Maria Chernova from Russia uh, Maria would you like to ask a question Maria? If Maria can hear us. She had an interesting question to ask. She wants to know, can the Panama leaks data be useful to reveal tobacco industries corrupt corruption schemes? Who would like to take that? John or Ivana? John should take answer. Hello. Ivana or John, would you like to answer this question? The Panama Leaks database, can it be useful to reveal tobacco industries corrupt schemes? I think this is a this is indeed question for John. Uh, I'm not familiar with any any of um, of the documents that would show really the the corruption of tobacco industry and governments. I, I believe the Panama Papers are more uh, in terms of um, uh, offshore investments and uh, you know avoiding taxes from from investments. But that's only my personal knowledge and um, so. So yeah, that's uh, okay. I don't know. I I think John is having some internet problems at his end. He's trying to rectify it. Uh, meanwhile, there has there is a question uh, that uh, why are governments not banning tobacco in the interest of people's health? Uh, is revenue more important for them? This is a question from Dr. Manju Agarwal from Amity University, India, and a similar question from Mercy Chaluma from Malawi and Mercy wants to know what can be done to sensitize people in economies like Malawi that rely on tobacco revenues. Sometimes it seems uh, unpatriotic as if the, uh, if the journalist says that, say that uh, tobacco should be banned because uh, uh, it is always said that tobacco is, an, is a huge revenue earner. 
I can tell uh, this uh, some quota, uh, this some important data. Yeah, I will answer this question. Yes. Actually, uh, this is absolutely a myth. It is wrong that the uh, revenue is more important. The point is they are projecting it wrongly. In uh, in India itself, the Indian Council of Medical Research had a study done uh, some times back, and which showed that 24,000 crores where there was the money which was uh, collected as a revenue, 24,000 crores in one year from tobacco and 27,000 crore were spent only on lung cancer by the government. You can imagine where is the benefit. There is no question. And the benefit may be only which is again something of a wrong type, a type of bribing going on in the, in the back. Otherwise, revenue is not the, the reason for here. Revenue is the reason in alcohol. In tobacco, it is so much harmful, it is causing so much health hazard that this is going to lose the money. Government already was spending 3,000 crore extra after getting what 24,000, they were spending 27,000 crore on this authentic study by Indian Council of Medical Research. So therefore, that is not the point, it's wrong. Thank you very much. I think we have already exceeded the time limit by 10 minutes. Sorry for that. Uh, the rest of the questions participants can send an uh, email to the panelists and we will be sending the webinar recordings also as usual uh, later on. And I would like to end once again remembering Yul Francisco Dorado and his contribution to tobacco control globally. Thank you everyone for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.